Vista School District here. Vista School District here. We'd like to welcome you to the second Be There Parent Night. I'd like to thank Midlands Community Foundation and the Papillion La Vista Schools Foundation for helping support tonight's program. In an effort to strengthen the relationship between school and home, the Papillion La Vista School District is bringing a monthly speaker on a variety of topics. We are very excited about tonight's presentation because it connects directly to what we are trying to accomplish in our schools. Over the past year, we've been implementing the Developmental Assets Framework. Developmental assets provide schools and parents a framework for what students need to succeed. Tomorrow, our featured speaker, Clay Roberts, will be working with all staff on how to become asset builders with our students. Tonight, Clay Roberts will be sharing what kids need to succeed from a parent perspective. As a former educator, Clay comes to us from Washington as an expert in health education. He served as a consultant in over 40 states and six foreign countries such as the Disney Channel, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Clay's message has been shared with over 700 international, national, state, and local events as a keynote speaker. He was recently featured on NBC Today's show as a prevention expert. Clay has numerous publications such as Building Assets in School Communities and Great Places to Learn, How Asset Building Schools Help Students Succeed. Clay is known for his providing of practical strategies that you can implement in your own home. Please join me in welcoming Clay Roberts, sharing what kids need to succeed. I'm just gonna, thanks, man. Thank you. Um, that's one of those introductions that you wish your mom and dad were here to appreciate. They're never here at the right time. Um, it is nice to be here in, in Omaha this evening, and I know, I'm smart enough to know, I am supposed to say it's nice to be here, but I left Seattle this morning. I don't know if anybody has watched what happened yesterday in Seattle, but we had, we had about, we had this unseasonal s snowstorm. Um, I've been 24 hours without power at my house. I left my wife with all of that. Um, it took me about three and a half hours to get to the airport this morning, and I, and I left on a seven o'clock flight. So the first thing I want to tell you, I got here, I looked in the mirror, I looked really bad. So, so the first thing I want to, I, I washed my face, I thought it would get better, it didn't, okay? So the first thing I want to tell you, if you look at me right now, I look drug affected. I want to assure you I'm not. I am sleep deprived and, and a little beat up and it kind of looks the same. So I just want to make sure there's probably some people in the audience going, I don't know if I would li listen to this guy. Um, and then I kind of reflected on the last few years. I've done a lot of this work and I've been on the road for the last three weeks essentially doing this work. And, and, and I was trying to reflect on why I look so bad. And, and here's the story. Um, about four years ago, I went in for my annual physical, which you when, you, you, when you get to be this age, you do this pretty religiously. So I went in for my annual physical to find um, that I had a 90% blockage in my left main coronary artery, so we had to do bypass surgery. So the next year, I go in for my physical to find out that both of my bypass grafts have failed, and, and they had to do a double barrel stent in my left main coronary artery, which isn't something they like to do. And I went in last year for my annual physical to find out that scarring had developed over my stents, so we had to do angioplasty. <laughs> when I said I'm really glad to be here in Omaha today, you really don't understand. I'm really glad to be anywhere, okay? <laughs> and, and I'm not telling you that for sympathy. I'm actually telling you that for two reasons. First of all, it'll probably explain some of the bizarre behavior you see up here this evening. First of all, they have me on niacin right now, and I'm having hot flashes. For some of you in the audience, you're going, been there, done that. But for me, this is a new experience. And I used to have sympathy for my wife. I now have empathy. It's a whole different deal, OK? <laughs> and when they do the surgery, they put you on a heart-lung machine, and they stop your heart. And when they restart you, there are memory problems associated with this. And there are some uh, emotional things that go on that I qu don't quite understand, which I've been experiencing both of those. So I want to apologize to Ron in the beginning. I may not remember all of what you told me to do here this evening, but, but they put you on this drug that changes you from a type A to a type B personality. So I, I may not remember, but I don't give a rip, which is, <laughs> which is an interesting way to live your life. I have some of those drugs along with me if anybody needs them. So, um, But what I thought we'd do this evening, uh, I, 
usually, it was a very nice introduction, and you might expect I'm going to talk with you uh, as a professional. But what I'd really like to do is talk with you as a parent this evening. Um, my wife and I, Sherry and I, are the parent of, uh, parents of two daughters. Um, these are our girls. Um, Amy on the left is 35. Emily on the left is, on the right is 32. Um, Amy is a graduate of Santa Clara University in Lewis and Clark, has a master's degree. Um, was a college athlete, um, second grade teacher, uh, is the parent of uh, our two grandsons. And grandparenting may be one of the few things in life that isn't overrated. It's better than I thought it was going to be. Um, she uh, quit teaching and, and has her own online business uh, called PlumTot.com, and she develops baby uh, things, accessories, clothes, and has local women in Portland, Oregon sew them, and she sells them online and is able to stay home with the kids. Um, Emily on the right just finished dual master's degrees from Berkeley. Um, she uh, just came back from spending six months in Bangladesh uh, with Mohammed Yumus, who is the who won the Nobel Peace Prize for microloans to Muslim women below the poverty line, and she spent six months in Bangladesh um, learning more about the public health implications of that work, not just the economic implications of that work. Um, she's a volunteer at Oakland Children's Hospital and works with parents who've lost a child. Now, I could have told you, I could have started out by telling you, Amy is too sensitive and she's never on time. I could have told you that Emily has a temper like her dad's, and she's very opinionated. You know what? Here's, here's what I've learned. I've, I've spent the last 30 plus years working in this field, and, and we will do more to shape and change children's behavior by focusing on what's right with them, not what's wrong with them. You see, here's what we do in America. We look at the kids who don't make it. We look at the kids who use drugs, we look at young people who are violent. We look at gang activity, and we ask, what went wrong here, and how can we fix them? And although that's an important question, if you only look at the kids who don't make it, you come up with a skewed view of the world. There's another group of kids you need to look at. Who are they? See, I think they're the kids who are doing well, and you need to ask, what went right here? And how do we make that happen more consistently, more often for our children? Actually, there's a third group of young people who are the most interesting to look at. They are the children who come from adversity and make it in spite of that adversity. How many of you know one of those incredibly resilient kids? Yeah. They're the most interesting kids to look at. So tonight, uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about what's wrong with children. I want to talk about what's right with them. And in, in order to start that out, and this is kind of hard in a group that's this spread out, I'm, I thought I'd encourage you at any point you want to move down front, that would be good. Um, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to start this evening by, by taking just a moment to think about what's right with your kids. Many of you are here tonight. I think this is the choir. I mean, when you do this, um, the, the night before Thanksgiving Eve, I didn't think anybody was going to show this evening. So good for you for showing. But, uh, and my guess is you're already very involved in the lives of your, of your kids. But I want to start this evening by having you think for just a moment about what's right with your kids. What are you proud about? Um, and, and what are they doing well? And, and here's what I want you to do. With somebody really close by, and if you came with your spouse, I want you to find somebody else other than your spouse to talk with about this, because you know that. But just turn around with somebody close by and introduce yourself, and I want you to tell them for a moment, how many children do you have? And I want you to tell them something that's right with each of those children, all right? Just bear with me. I think, I think it'll, it'll help us through the evening. So turn around, find somebody in here who you don't know really quickly, and take just a moment to tell them what's right with your child. Now, when you hear the train whistle this evening, it's time to thank your colleague or partner. And, and um, here's what I want you to think about for just a moment. Um, you will do more to shape and change your children's behavior by focusing on what's right, not what's wrong with them. Uh, and I, I learned this in, in some really important ways. I got hired in 1972 as the drug education coordinator for the greater Seattle area. Evidently, I did my work really well because after one year, the funding went away. And I, must, and I viewed that as we must have cleared up the drug problem in one year. So the next year, I got hired as the VD coordinator. This was before sexually transmitted diseases. Evidently, I did my job just as well because after one year, the funding went away. 
The year after that, I got hired as the teen pregnancy coordinator for the county. <laughs> teen pregnancy prevention coordinator for the county. <laughs> <laughs> which is different if you think about that for a second. And get this, they gave us nine months worth of funding to deal with teen pregnancy prevention, and then the funding went away. See, that's how we do things in America. You know, we focus on the crisis of the year, the disease of the month, or the organ of the year. And, and as part of my work, um, I'm a recovering junior high school teacher. I probably should have said that up front. I, I made the mistake of spending time out in the hallways on Friday afternoons and on Monday mornings listening to what my kids were talking about. What are they talking about on Friday afternoon? Parties and the weekend and what's going to happen. Actually, I found Monday mornings to be more interesting out in the hallway than Friday afternoon. Because if you spend time on Monday morning, you get to hear what happened. And our kids were talking about, this is a middle school, we're talking about who got drunk and who didn't. When you hear conversations like that as a classroom teacher, you could pretend like you didn't hear what you just heard and go about your work, and when you do that, and we'll be talking with staff tomorrow about this, I think you send the wrong message. Uh, I think it's a real powerful message. It's the wrong message. So we began designing and developing programs. We've developed five national model programs. I went out and looked at these programs in action. Here's what I found. Thousands of school districts have purchased our programs. And the first thing I can tell you is very few are actually using them, which was really disappointing. The second thing, teachers would say, hey, come into the classroom, we're using your program. And you'd walk into their classroom, and you'd watch what they were doing. And what they were doing didn't look like what we had written. There wasn't a lot of fidelity between what we actually wrote and what actually happened with kids. That was disappointing. But where we saw things that really made a difference in the lives of kids, it had very little to do with the program. It had everything to do with who delivered the program. You see, I think we have lost sight about what really makes a difference in the lives of our kids. I don't think it's programs, I think it's people. And I want to tell you what the research tells me is you are the most important person in the success of your children. Not the school system, not the parks and recreation department, not the pastor at your church. You are the best predictor of whether your children are going to make it or not. So the fact that you're here this evening, I want to make sure that we we share as much as we can about what we know really makes a difference. So um, as you came in this evening, you picked up a packet. One of the things in that packet is a buff-colored brochure, multi-page, entitled The Asset Approach, 40 Developmental Assets. Could we have the next slide up here, please? And if you turn just one page inside that, and you can just keep hitting these so we have um, all of these categories up here. You'll notice there's a list. Um, this research that I'm going to share with you this evening comes from Search Institute. Search is a research institute out of Minneapolis, Minnesota that has been looking at healthy, academically successful children for the past 25 plus years. They've been trying to figure out what young people need in order to succeed. Look at this list in front of you. They call these things developmental assets. Now the first thing I'd like to tell you this evening, I don't like the term. I'm not their employee. I'll tell you where I agree with them and where I disagree with them. I don't like the term developmental assets. I don't think it communicates really clearly what this is all about. I want you to think of these as the fundamental building blocks that children need in order to succeed. Look at, look at number three on this list. Children who have three or more adults in their life, in addition to their parents, who spend time with them, who encourage them, and who call them on things when they're doing things that are inappropriate, those children do better. They do better academically. Do you believe that? That's what the research says. They are also, interestingly enough, less likely to be involved in drug use or violent behavior. Do you believe that one? Yeah. Colin Powell talks about growing up. He said, there wasn't, there wasn't an internet when I grew up. There was an anti-net. <laughs> These are women in the neighborhood who thought they were your aunties. They really weren't. But if they saw you doing something that was appropriate, it, they would say, I'm really proud of you for what you just did. And if they saw you doing things that were inappropriate, it was likely that they would call you on that. That doesn't go on in many communities anymore, OK? Look at number nine on this list. Children who spend an hour a week in community service, giving back to the communities in which they live, they're, they're not just takers, they're givers. Those children are much less likely to be involved in drug use or violent behavior. Do you believe that? Yeah. Look at 11, 12, and 13 on this list. 
Kids who have boundaries, family boundaries, school boundaries, and community boundaries are really important to the healthy development of children. You can help me out with this. How many of you as a kid growing up knew where the line was? How many knew when you crossed it? How many knew what would happen when you crossed it? It's not as clear for many children today. But boundaries are really important to the healthy development of children. Look at, look at number 16 on this list. Kids who grow up with an adult in their life who expects a lot from them do much, much better. Again, <laughs> you can help me out with this. How many of you as a kid growing up had somebody who expected a whole lot of you? How many of you tried to meet those expectations? How many of you are still trying to meet those expectations? Seriously, how many of you do things the way you do them, even though some of these people may be dead and gone or no longer in our lives? If they could see us doing our work, we'd want them to be proud of the way we do what we do with our own children and in our community. Anybody believe that one? Yeah. I love this list. You know why? There's a lot of rhetoric around the fact that it takes, it takes a village to raise a child. And I do believe it takes a village. But no one ever talks about what the village needs to look like. For the first time on one sheet of paper, each of the items research-based, this is a picture of what the village of Omaha needs to look like if we were serious about raising healthy, successful children. This is the list they should have sent us home from the hospital with. Anybody doing what I did the first time I saw this list? Because this is not my research. Anybody going down this list right now and mentally checking off what your own children would say they have in their life? Anybody doing that right now? <laughs> when I first saw this, our girls were teenagers. I took this list home, made copies of it, and gave them each the next evening. I gave them each a copy at the dinner table. And I asked them to go down this list and check off how many of these they thought we had in our family. Okay. And, and what I learned that evening is they didn't answer it correctly. <laughs> there were several items I thought they should have checked and they didn't check them. And I got really defensive and, and, it, and the conversation didn't go really well until I stopped being defensive and I just started listening. And when I started listening, here's what I learned that evening. My children's perception was their reality. Whether I agreed with it or not wasn't important. If I thought we were doing a terrific job and my girls didn't see it, what it said to me is, maybe we better do it a little differently in my house. Does that make sense to you? So rather than listening to me talk about this, here's what I'd like you to do for just a moment. Um, again, I happen to believe this is the choir here this evening. So, um, But I also believe, I think what I want to talk about this evening for most of you is how do you move from good to great? And I think many of you in this audience are doing a really good job with your kids. And you're here tonight because you've, you've already invested a lot in your children, okay? So, but, but I do think there's a difference between good and great. And what I also know, at least I've observed a lot, is sometimes good is the enemy of great. When you think you're good, sometimes you're reluctant or less likely to take the next step, which is really to move to a higher level with your kids, because we're doing pretty good. Well. I would suggest that, that we, all of us in this room, myself included, could do a little better than we're doing right now, okay? Um, and it's not just with your own children, because if you want your kids to make it, it's about building these assets in the lives of the kids that they hang out with, not just your own children. You dramatically increase the odds that your kids are going to do well if the kids around them are pretty healthy and doing well as well, okay? So, Here's what I'd like you to do. Rather than listening to me here, I, I want to engage you this evening in this process. So um, I'd like you to go down this list. And if you don't want to write on this list, you have a second packet that's stapled together. And um, it looks like this. And the first couple pages give you some background on Search Institute. Um, including uh, their website address. They've got some, I think, great resources for parents. So if you want to know and you want to go deeper after this evening, you can access more information online from Search Institute, whose research I'm sharing with you. But right behind that, you have a list of the assets again. So if you don't want to mess up your brochure, here's what I want you to do. Go down this list and put a check mark beside those things that you do already with your children. And I know sometimes it's not a question of, 
do I do it or don't I do it, it's a matter of degree. But if, but, but if you can say to yourself honestly, I usually do that or I do that pretty consistently with my kid, then put a check mark beside it, okay? Go down the list, put a check mark beside those things that you are doing pretty consistently with your children, okay? And then what I'd like you to do is circle the two or three that you do really well, okay? I happen to believe that you're here this evening because you've already made it a priority to help your children succeed. So circle the two or three that you do really well. And then I'd like you to underline the two or three that you'd like to do just a little better. If you're here with a spouse, what I would suggest you do is do this independently for a moment. Because your perceptions may be different. And I think it's healthy to have that conversation. So go down the list, put a check mark beside those that you do pretty consistently. Circle the two or three that you do really well underline the two or three that you'd like to do just a little bit better, okay? Just in a minute or so more, when you finish, I want you to count up how many you checked, totally, and make sure that you've, you've circled the two or three that you do really well, and make sure you've underlined the two or three that you'd like to do just a little better than you're doing right now with your kids. It doesn't mean you don't do it at all, it just means that we could do this one better. So here's what I want you to do. If you've, if you've finished that process, if you're here with a spouse, this is a good, if you've both looked at it independently, um, I want you to talk with each other about your perceptions of what you do well and what you'd like to do just a little better. If you're here kind of solo, what I want you to do again is find a partner really quickly, and it can be the same partner you talked with last time, that's fine. But I want you to talk, and you can make these groups of two or three, but I think Rather than listening to me all night, I think it's more helpful. There's, there's a book called The Wisdom of Crowds. John Selawicki is the author. And what he says, in a group this large and a group this diverse, the crowd is smarter than the guy up front. There's more wisdom in this room about what children need in order to succeed than I possess. When you look at the collective years of parenting in this room, and you look at um, your own experience as a young person growing up, I think there's a whole lot of wisdom in this room. It's not all centered up here. And what I want you to do is just kind of tap that wisdom here for a moment and share with a colleague, a partner, a neighbor out here in the audience just for a moment, what do you do well? And it's okay to brag. You know, I think sometimes people, they play it down. No, I really want you to be, be uh, clear about what you do well. And, and I also want you to be honest about what you'd like to do just a little better. I think when people publicly commit to this, they're more likely to do it, is my experience. So I'm, I'm asking you to make a public commitment, either to your partner or to a neighbor or friend or colleague, somebody you came with this evening. What do you do well? What would you like to do a little better? Everybody take just a moment to do that, which means you can get up out of your chair and you can move because everybody's spread out in here, so this makes it a little difficult. If you don't have a partner, wave your hand. That means I'm looking for a partner. Okay. If you are without a partner, wave, and whoever sees you waving who does not have a partner, that's your partner for this little exercise. Thank your partners. Thanks for doing this. How many of you found common ground on your list, even though you did it independently? How many of you found some common ground on your list in terms of the things you did well? What are some of the things that came out that you do well? Support, um, and that doesn't surprise me. How many of you talked about support and the kind of support you give your children? Yeah, and again, many of you are here tonight because this is all, part of your ongoing commitment to support your children, and so I, I, I would expect that there's a lot of support going on. Anything else that you talked about where th there was common ground on the list? Involvement in, in kids' schooling and their activities, yeah. And again, I would, I would guess that that was pretty consistent. How, how many of you found common ground in terms of the things that you don't do as well as you'd like to do? Anybody want to share any of those? Time at home. It's really hard when you take a look at everybody's activities and everybody's busy schedule to budget time to really take time with your kids. This does take time. Building assets doesn't happen by accident. It, it takes time. 
And, and, and you need to schedule that time and make it a priority. But I know, because you know, we've, we've done this too, that, that kids have different activities and, and all these things going on, for really to have some quality family time is hard to come by. What else did you find uh, some consistency in, in terms of areas where you want to get better, do a better job? Service to others, yeah. How many of you grew up doing something in terms of serving others? And, and it's, what we do know is the kids who do that are much less likely to be involved in gang activities. They're much less likely to be involved in drug use. They do better in school. There's a variety of reasons. And our communities are better places when they do that. Um, so uh, I just wanted to make sure that you kind of look at your own family to start this evening out. And, and I, I want to go f through a few things on this list. The first thing I want you to know is I love this list, but the first thing I would tell you is the list is not complete. Not everything that a child needs is on this list. Let me give you some examples. There's nothing about physical health on this list. Nutrition, exercise, we know those make a huge difference for children, not on the list. Work ethic isn't on the list. I happen to believe kids who work hard do better than the kids who don't. Anybody else think that's true? Sense of humor is not on the list. I don't have a lot of research that supports this, but I do believe the kids that can laugh at themselves do better than the kids who don't. Anybody else think that's true? Yeah, and actually there is some research that supports that. And uh, I asked a group of high school students recently, what's missing from this list? You know what they told me? Pets. And, and I kind of laughed when this young man said it, and he laughed too. And I said, why do you think that's important? He said, well, my dog loves me no matter what I do. <laughs> and then I realized we're, what we're really talking about this evening is becoming the person that your dog thinks you are. Because if you're as good as your dog thinks you are, you'd be better for your kids, I think, okay? Um, so the first thing I would tell you is the list isn't complete. The second thing I want you to know, as much as I love this list, um, I think that there's a lot of confusion when people look at this list. Uh, I think some people confuse developmental assets and economic assets, okay? And let me just give you a quick example. I did a workshop in the Montebello School District, East Los Angeles. I came back and did a second workshop. And I asked the staff, what did you learn and what did you do with this model since I've, I was last there? And, and one of the women in the audience, her name is Jasmine. She's an elementary counselor in the district. She said, well, here's what I've learned. But she said, the first thing I want to tell you is I want to tell you about my family for a moment. She said, we have nine kids in my family. My brother's a doctor. I'm a I'm a counselor, my sister's a principal. She went down this list of nine incredibly accomplished kids. She said, I want to tell you about my parents for a moment. She said, my parents moved here from El Salvador when we were very young. She said, my parents have worked all kinds of jobs to support our family growing up. We get together at Christmas every year at my parents' home, she said, all my brothers and sisters, and we marvel at what an accomplished family we have become. She said, by most people's standards, my family was economically poor, but asset rich. She said, many of the kids that I work with today, by my family standards, they would be considered economically rich, but asset poor. How many of you know parents who are working two jobs to give their kids things? Their own iPhone, $100 tennis shoes, you know what? They don't need more things. They need more positive adult presence in their life. Uh, I was at a, I did a presentation like this not too long ago, and, a, and an older fellow in the audience, a grandfather, came up to me and he said, you know, if I had to do this all over again, I would spend twice as much time and half as much money on my kids. I want you to notice that the things on this list don't cost money, you know? And, and I, I want to make sure that as you think about your own children and the children that you, you, your kids hang out with, do not assume because they have some material wealth that they necessarily have high levels of assets. And conversely, don't assume because children come from poverty that they necessarily have low levels of assets. It doesn't necessarily work out that way, okay? Another thing I want you to think about as you look at this list, um, I, uh, I, I live on Bainbridge Island, Washington, west of Seattle. 
Uh, we're one of 800 communities who have surveyed our kids, this asset survey. Um, over three and a half million kids nationally have taken this survey. Okay? And, and we did this survey, and we have terrific schools. And when we looked at the data from our kids, notice that um, if you turn back to that asset page, that list of 40 things, notice there are percentages over in the right-hand column. Look at the second asset. What percentage of kids say they can talk with their parents about the things that are really important in their life? Less than a third, 28 percent. And, and, uh, and those numbers are very close to what, what's going on in my community, and I think we have a terrific community. And, and look at number five. I was working with the schools in our community. What percentage of kids say they go to school in a caring school climate? Less than a third. Our staff wouldn't believe it. They asked me to do focus groups because they wouldn't believe the data. And, and so I pulled together a group of 20 high school students. I have them sitting in a circle. I have the faculty from the high school, middle school, and elementary school on the outside looking in like a fishbowl. I'm asking the kids why those numbers are so low. See, the numbers don't tell you what the kids are trying to tell you. It's the dialogue that begins to illuminate this. And the first kid said, you know what? Our elementary experiences were a whole lot more asset rich than our secondary experiences. The teachers cared, us about, cared about us as people at the elementary level. And at the secondary level, they care about their subject matter. That was the kid's perception, right or wrong, okay? The second kid said, you know, caring, you know why this number is so low? He said, because caring school climate isn't just about how teachers treat you, it's about how kids treat one another here. And he said, you know, at the middle school level, kids pick on each other a lot. That's why that number is so low. I wouldn't have thought about that. The kids brought this to our attention. It's the dialogue that begins to illuminate this. A third really courageous young lady said it clearer than anybody else, 16 years old. She said, I have three great classes in the morning, three great teachers, and then I have to go to fourth period. She said, I hate to come to school because of a fourth period. And she said, if you were serious about this stuff, you wouldn't let him teach here. Now, you can feel the tension in the room because all the staff are standing on the outside. Everybody knows who she's talking about. He's standing there with his cronies, and he's smart enough to know she's talking about him. She's in his fourth period class. This young lady committed academic suicide to make her point. And you can feel the tension in the air, and so I'm trying to diffuse this a little bit. And so I said to the kids, why do you think some staff do this and others don't? Why do you think some staff build assets while others don't? And the first kid said, I think the staff that don't do this, they don't do it because no one ever did it for them as a kid growing up. They don't know how. Another kid said, hard to fill us up if you're not full. So we came up with a new strategy that afternoon. Here's our new strategy. Feed the adults so they don't eat the kids. <laughs> I'm serious. Look at this list for a minute. Is this a list of what children need? See, I, I think it's a list of what human beings need. How many of you still need love and support in your life? Good, almost half of you. How many of you still want positive communication between your children and you and, and, and another parent or, or extended family? Yeah. How many of you still want positive role models that you, look, you can look up to and believe in in these tough times that face our nation ahead? <laughs> this is not a list of what children need. I think it's a list of what human beings need. If you want to do a better job with your kids, I think you need to take better care of one another. I think you need to be more supportive of one another. I think you need to build assets with, with one another. So I'm going to give you a few assignments this evening, but your first assignment is I want you to engage in random acts of asset building with your children and with each other. Because when your tank's pretty full, the kids know the difference. When you're feeling pretty good and you're pretty asset rich, I think your children do better. Um, and it, parenting is, is difficult work under the best of conditions. So if you're here with a spouse, it's about talking about how you support one another in building these assets for one another so that you can be there for your kids. Um, if you have a, a friend here with you and a neighbor with you, it's about how do we support each other and, and do a better job supporting our kids. I, I really think this is not just about your children this evening. I think it's about you. Because when you're doing well, your children do better. If you want to know what a random act of asset building looks like, I want to make sure that you don't go away confused. So um, in your packet this evening that you picked up, 
you have a brochure that looks like this. It says 150 ways to show kids you care. You can stick this on your refrigerator door at home. It also could be retitled 150 ways to show people that you care. It's not just children, because a lot of these work with adults and, and others. But, I, but I, the first assignment this evening is I want you to engage in random acts of asset building, because I think when we do that, um, we do better and our kids do better, OK? The other thing I want to make sure is, as you think about this work, this is, um, when I think about asset building, someone said, define for me an asset builder. What are you talking about when you say asset builder? Well, here's my definition. If you breathe, you're on the team, OK? I, I, I was doing a workshop not too long ago in the Saga School District in Southern California, and they gave an award to one of their custodians at, at the break. He's a night custodian in an elementary school. I'm not sure the kids would know him if they saw him on the street, because he's usually in the building after hours. But here's what he did. He spray painted the dustpan gold. He calls it the Golden Dustpan Award. He leaves it in the classroom each evening that is the cleanest classroom. Children compete to get the Golden Dustpan Award because he leaves it with cookies. The kids in this building call him the cookie monster. They write notes to the cookie monster. He writes some notes back. And when he got this award, he said, I can't believe you're giving me an award for doing this. He said, I don't work as hard as I used to. Because <laughs> the kids are cleaning the classroom, see? And he said, and, and the cookies aren't even very good. They're cheap. He said, but the kids are writing me notes, and I'm writing them back. And he said, I think that's good that, they, that they're writing more. Do you think he's an asset builder? St. Louis Park, Minnesota, a group of senior citizens that in, in St. Louis Park, they presented this model to 60 groups in 60 days that touched the lives of kids. You know, what I really want you to understand this evening, what we're doing here and what we're doing tomorrow, we're not trying to introduce another new program. I happen to believe there are already some great programs for young people in this school system. How many of you believe that? Yeah. I don't think you need another program, okay? And if you came here tonight hoping for one more new program, you just needed one more program for your kids that it would make that huge difference, I think we're missing the point. I'm not, I'm not talking about a program this evening. I'm talking about a movement. And the movement begins with each of us, okay? It's a different way of engaging our own kids. It's a different way of looking at our work. Um, and, and this language, the asset language, makes perfect sense to me. It's, it, it, I think you need a common language and a common vision if you want to make this a better community for, for your kids. Okay? So I, I just want you to understand anybody can do this work. But in St. Louis Park, Minnesota, we presented this model to 60 groups in 60 days that touched the lives of kids, from Kiwanians to quilters. We were trying to create a movement in St. Louis Park. One of the groups was a group of senior citizens at a senior center. Um, after the presentation, we presented the model that we're presenting to you this evening. One of the women in the audience stood up and she said, you know what, our big project here in St. Louis Park is we adopt highways. We go out and pick up the trash along the highway. She said, I got an idea. Our kids are more important than the trash. Let's adopt bus stops. She organized the senior citizens in her community to adopt bus stops. They're there in the morning when the kids get on the bus to go to school. Their job is to know each child by name and to know what they're good at and to encourage them to do their best each day at school. This lady gets it. She organized the seniors and she said, many of us don't have a lot of money, but we do have time and our children need our time more than they need our money. Many of us are there in the afternoon when kids get off the bus to find out how their day was and check in with them and encourage them to do their homework and do the right things after school. Do you think she's an asset builder? Portland, Oregon, I presented this model to a group of parents and, and staff at Beaumont Middle School. I came back and did a second workshop a few months later. And I asked, what have you done since the last time I was here? And one of the women in the audience, her name is Nancy. She's the parent of an eighth grade boy. She said, well, the last time you were here, you said, use your strengths to build assets with kids. She said, I tried to fi figure out what I'm good at. She said, I'm a good cook. So I started out doing pancake breakfast on Friday morning for my son, who's an eighth grader and eight of his friends. Every Friday, they, they come to my house for pancakes before they go to school. She said, I'm flipping pancakes, and I'm involved in conversations I never dreamed I would be having with eighth grade boys. I know more about my son, and I know more about his friends than I ever would have known before. She said, I got three other moms to do this, so on any given Friday morning, we have at least 25 kids collectively at our house for pancakes. She said, I think we're building assets through pancakes. What do you think? Thousands of ways of doing this work. 
But here's why this is so important. Can we go to the next slide, please? I know you're up there. <laughs> here's why this becomes so important. If you look at the next page uh, on your uh, brochure, you'll see a set of bar graphs, OK? Looks like this. Look at the bottom set of bar graphs, third one over from the left, and it's labeled illicit drug use. Everybody see that? Here's what I can tell you. The average kid in America has 19 of these assets in their life. And you might wonder, so what? Here's the so what. If you look up here on the screen, illicit drug use is represented by the light blue bars. And what I can tell you is the kids who have between 0 and 10 assets, no more than 10, 38% of them, you can see this on your, on your data in front of you, 38% of them are engaged in illicit drug use. These are 6th graders through 12th graders. Kids who have fewer than 10, 38% of them are engaged in illicit drug use. But look at the next category over. Those kids who have between 11 and 20, drug use drops from 38% to 18%. It drops by more than half as assets increase by 10. And look at the next category over. Those kids who had between 21 and 30 assets, drug use drops again from 18% to 6%. Everybody following this? Those young people who have over 30, only 1% were engaged in illicit drug use. That's a huge difference from 38% to 1%. Here's what I want you to pay attention to. Don't just look at illicit drug use. Look at any of these high-risk behaviors. As assets increase, all of these high-risk behaviors dramatically decrease for children. Everybody see that? Again, over 3.5 million kids surveyed. So this is a pretty significant, significant end that we're looking at here, number. Look at the top set of bar graphs. Uh, next slide, please. They're even more important than the bottom set. Um, things like success in school, maintaining good health, valuing diversity, Here's what I can tell you. As assets increase, the reason I want you to do this with your kids, you get two for one when you do it this way. I was in Sacramento not too long ago doing a presentation like this to a group of parents. And I asked them, what do you want your kids to look like at age 25? If you've done a terrific job as parents and the school district has done their job well and, and community organizations have done their job well, what would they look like at age 25 if we'd all done our work well? And one of the moms in the audience said, I want my girls to be safe and drug free. And I thought about that for a moment. We have two daughters, don't get me wrong, I want them to be safe and drug free. But I thought that was a sad goal. I mean, I know kids who are 25 years old who are safe and drug free and sitting on their butts doing nothing, still living at home. That's not my definition of success, the absence of disease. You think we could set the bar a little higher? How about? maintaining good health? How about still learning? How about um, exhibiting leadership and giving something back to their communities, all right? So notice that what happens as you build assets, you get higher levels of, of thriving on the part of children and lower levels of high-risk behavior, okay? So that's why we want you to do this. It's not just intuitive. I know many of you, when you look at this list, you believed it. You didn't need to see the data, but the data is dramatic. What I can tell you as an example is the best drug education programs in America implemented with fidelity to the original model. Over multiple years' time, the best we've ever been able to show is six percentage points different in terms of drug use and non-drug use. Notice this is so much more dramatic than any drug education program available today for kids. Okay? So here's what I thought we'd do. For the remaining half hour or whatever we have here, what I want to do is give you some practical strategies about how to do this. If this is making sense, if, you, if you, you're saying, yeah, I get it, this makes sense to me, I'd like to be a little more deliberate and intentional as an asset builder with my children. The question is, what do you do differently? All right. So <clears throat> I'm just going to jump in. And I thought what I'd try and do is give you four strategies this evening to deal with four different asset categories. Notice that they, I don't want you to have to remember 40 different things here. But the categories are really important. Support, empowerment, boundaries, and expectations, OK? Commitment to learning. So I thought it might be useful to give you four strategies to deal with four of these different asset categories. Does that make sense? 
So I'm going to try and go through these really quickly. Let's take first the area of support. And, and many of you are doing this and doing it well, but I want to give you one more way of thinking about support. Can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> Um, I think you, there's some wisdom in this room, so help me out. How many of you can think of somebody who, who supported you as a kid growing up, um, and it can be a parent or a non-parent? How many of you can think of somebody who really made a difference for you as a kid growing up? Raise your hand high. Look around this room. How long ago were these people in your lives? Some of us are still lucky to have them in our lives, but, but some of the people we're talking about were in our lives 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, yet you remember them boom like that. Um, I think they must have done something pretty powerful. For me, in addition to my parents, and I had a pretty supportive family, it was my seventh grade teacher, Mrs. McClellan, social studies teacher, who took me aside one day outside of class, no other kids around, and she said, I've seen your IQ test. She said, you're really bright, but you're not working up to your potential, and I'm going to expect more of you than I expect of other kids. We'll work together, but you and I are going to go to a higher level this year. I worked incredibly hard for her. And then it occurred to me about two years later, we never took IQ tests. <laughs> I have four brothers and sisters. We all went to the same school. None of us ever remember taking an IQ test. And to this day, I'm still wondering how many kids she took outside her classroom and told them the same thing she told me. I mean, I still remember walking back into class feeling sorry for the poor dumb kids in my class because I was so smart. I think she got me, okay? So I just want you to think about the people who made a difference in what they did. And, and I think part of what they do is, is they take a personal interest in us, okay? And they got to know us, and they really got to know what we were good at, and they did a lot of things for us. Go to the next slide. Go through that really quickly, and I want the one right after this. Next slide, okay? There we go. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about in terms of support with your children is I want you to think about, do you know their love language? Do you know what I'm talking about? There are two authors. Their names are Campbell and Chapman. They have a series of books out on love languages. It's their contention that each of us has a primary love language, a way that we understand that people really care about us. Okay? Let me give you the first one, physical touch. How many of you have a toucher at home? When you think about your own children? Yeah. Our youngest daughter, Emily, from the moment she was born, I'm talking about the moment, she was a snuggler and a cuddler. And when I would go on the road when she was younger, I needed to be ready because when I came home and opened up the door, she would come flying at me, jump into my arms. She wanted to just cuddle and snuggle and read. That's been Emily from the moment she was born, okay? She's a toucher, okay? And for the dads in this room, I, I want to I say, some, I know some of you, this may not be your primary love language. And here's what I want you to think about. Most of Campbell and Chapman's work was done on, on marriage retreats with couples. They found that couples had problems in their relationship if they didn't speak the same love language. If you're a toucher and your spouse is not, you're thinking, if he really loved me, he'd just be a little more affectionate. He's thinking... I am such a good guy. I remember every anniversary. I give her nice gifts. I publicly affirm what a wonderful person she is. I'm a good guy. And you're thinking, if he really loved me, he'd just be a little more affectionate. Does this make sense? You don't have to raise your hand if this is your relationship. I don't need to know that, okay? But again, kids have this. And for dads, this may not be your primary love language. Guys tend to be less demonstrative than women tend to be when, when you look at this. But it is really important you do this, especially, well, I think it's especially important that you do this both for your boys and your girls, okay? Um, I think a lot of our boys struggle because they've never had anybody model for them what appropriate touch looks like or what that, anybody see the, the piece on 60 Minutes piece on delinquent elephants in Africa? I'm not making this up, okay? <laughs> Here's the story. Several years ago in the Peelensburg National Park, they had an overpopulation of elephants. They were congregated in one area of the park. They didn't have enough food to support the elephant population, so they had to move them. They didn't have the technology to move big bulls, so they shot many of the big bulls because there were too many bulls, and they moved the young juveniles to other areas of the park. Elephants are pack animals led by adult bull males, and they, and they all of a sudden, they had young juvenile males leading the pack. 
And over a two-year period of time, 39 white rhinos were killed in the park by gangs of elephants, if you will. They'd never seen this behavior before. Elephants don't normally attack white rhinos. These elephants did. And over the next few years, they developed the technology to actually physically, they built trucks that were built specifically to move the big bulls. They learned how to tranquilize them and get them in the trucks. And as soon as they moved the big bulls around the park, the killing immediately stopped. What was missing is there weren't big bull elephants to model appropriate elephant behavior for little bull elephants. I just want the dads to be real clear in this room. I need you to be big, big bull elephants for your boys and for your girls, okay? But, but I think you need to model appropriate touch and, um, and model that real man can be strong and also be nurturing. You can do both, okay? Let's talk about the second one. How many of you have one at home that loves words of affirmation? Okay? You say something positive, they light up, they're pretty transparent. Okay? I want you to think this time, I want you to think about both spoken words and written words. Um, we did a project in Kansas and we developed pre-printed post-it notes with messages on them, and actually all we asked staff to do was complete the sentence. I brought a few of these along. Um, they say things like, I'm delighted when you, and all they had to do was complete the sentence. The next one says, you can feel very proud of yourself for, complete the sentence, all right? The next one says, you have no idea how much you helped me when, complete the sentence. What we found is, the kids who loved words of affirmation, as parents oftentimes were good at, at saying those words, which is really important, but it's also important to write them down. We found the kids who loved words of affirmation, if you put one of these on one of their assignments, they would read the assignment, look at the, the grade they got, they'd pull the post-it note off, throw the assignment away, but take the post-it note and stick it in their folder. They couldn't throw that away, okay? So some of our kids love, uh, love words of affirmation. How many of you know the child who, who wants your time? And they think if you really love me, you give me a little more time, okay? Both of our girls are time kids. And from, again, when they were little, um, we would go on dad and daughter dates together each month, each of the girls separately. And to this day, um, Emily at, at Christmas last year came home and said, Dad, we need to go on a date, which means I need your time. And she wanted to tell me about this new man in her life, which isn't exactly the date I had in mind with my daughter. But they just got engaged last week, so I guess this was an important conversation to have, okay? So, how many of you know the kids who love gifts? I'm not talking about big things, I'm talking about little things. Our oldest daughter, Amy, is a gift child. And I know this sounds weird, but I used to, when I was on the road doing this work, I would bring her back soap and shampoo from motel rooms. And, and I didn't get it, but when I opened the door, Emily would come flying at me. Amy would run up and say, Daddy, did you bring me soap? And, and I did, but I really didn't get it. You know why I didn't get it? We tend to speak whatever we are comfortable, whatever our love language is. And I'm not a gift guy. I didn't get it. And it finally occurred to me, it wasn't the soap. What the soap represented is she knew I thought about her when she was gone, okay? And how many of you know the child who loves acts of service? You fix them their favorite meal just because it's their favorite meal. You go to every performance of the play that they're in to watch them perform and you stick around afterwards every time to let them know how proud you are of the hard work they put in, okay? That's an act of service. So here's what I want you to think about with your own children. Do you know their love language? Okay? And sometimes you have to speak multiple languages. And, and just as an assignment here this evening, can we do this really quickly? We have post-it notes over here. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to take a post-it note for every child, at least one. You can take more than one. And, and what I would like you to do, everybody grab one or two post-it notes. We're going to send them down the, the, the aisle here. And this is kind of a, a great week to do this, I think, because family will be together, and, and um, what I want you to do is write a note to each of your children, and if you are here with your spouse, I want you both to write notes, not, not a collective note, oh, honey, you write it. No, you both need to write it. They need to hear from their dad and their mom that, that you 
know what's right with them. Again, you will do more to shape and change their behavior by focusing on what's right, not what's wrong. What I want you to do is write a note to each of your children. And again, if you need help, you can start that out with any of these sentence stems, you know, a special thank you for, I noticed something really special about you today, it is, I'm delighted when you fill in the blank. All you have to do is complete the sentence. This doesn't need to be long. It doesn't need to be drawn out. What I want you to do is write a, a, a written affirmation to your children about what you, what you appreciate about them, what's right with them, what you value um, in terms of their behavior and the way they act and treat others, okay? Take just a moment to jot a note to your child. And we, have, we put them on post-it notes so you can stick them in strategic spots. Tomorrow when they get up and they go walk into the bathroom on the mirror in the bathroom or on their plate at Thanksgiving dinner or in their lunch next week, I don't care where you put it, but I do think we, we say it often, we don't write it enough for our children, and I know that they treasure those things um, and they will keep them. So take a moment and I want you to write a note to each of your children. And I don't care what age they are. We're not just talking school age here. Now, for time's sake, if you're, if you're still writing, keep writing. But I, here's what I want you to do. How many of you are going to deliver these sometime in the next week? And, and I just want you to at, do it, watch their reaction, then ask them later, how did you like the note and how did you feel when, when you got the note? What I, what I find is we, we, say, we think we do this a lot with our kids, and I think we do. Uh, I think verbally many of you do this. I think it's really powerful when you write it, so I want you to, to, to write your kids or think about, just think about their love language and do you know their love language and do you speak it often, okay? Because I think we tend to speak our own, whatever we think is important, but sometimes we forget what they perceive as being important, the way they read that you really love and care about them, okay? So there's one strategy for support. I'm going to take another category. Look at that list of assets, that list of 40. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit here. I want to take the, uh, the area of social skills and social competencies with your children. I want to teach you really quickly 
asset number 35, how to teach your children to say no to their friends without losing their friends. Part of my background is I worked in juvenile detention for a while. And what I found is my kids knew the difference between right and wrong. They didn't know how to say no to their friends. And we do things, we say to kids in, in, in our country, we say things to kids like, just say no. Saying to a child, just say no, is like saying to someone who's clinically depressed, just have a nice day. What's the question, what's the question in the kid's mind? How? If you don't answer the how, you're not empowering them. See, I think it's really hard for children to say no to their friends because most adults don't know how to say no to their friends. Watch a group of adults at a party. Watch how easy it is for adults to say no to their friends. Why are we surprised when our children don't know how to do that? It's hard to teach your child a social skill that you don't possess. <laughs> In fact, I happen to believe that some of you are here this evening because you don't know how to say no to somebody. You don't have to raise your hand, okay? But if you pay really close attention for the next 10 minutes, you will have a strategy to use next time this happens, all right? So here's what I want you to do. I find that parents and adults are really comfortable teaching physical skills. They're not quite as comfortable teaching social skills to their kids, all right? So really quickly, stand up, face a partner. You've been sitting too long. Stand up, face a partner in this room. Really quickly, you put everything down. Now, here's what I want you to do. Tallest person in this group of two. You got this figured out? Got this figured out. Tallest person in this group of two, you're a five-year-old. Shortest person in this group of two, you're the parent of this five-year-old. Now, I want, I want you to do this really quickly. You all, and in this case, you have twins, OK? Because <laughs> there are two of you here, OK? A group of three. So here's what I need you to do. Five-year-olds, you've de or parents, you've decided it's time to teach your five-year-old a physical skill, which is how to open a door with a key. You can use props. You can use whatever you like. You have two minutes to do this. I want you to teach your five-year-old to open a door with a key. You've decided it's time, all right? Now, five-year-olds, here's what I want you to do. Although this is a physical skill, what it takes to teach a physical skill is very similar to what it takes to teach them a social skill. And I think you know how to do this. But five-year-olds, I want you to watch what your parent does in this little role play. And I'm going to ask your feedback really quickly, two minutes. Um, what did they do that helped you to learn this skill? OK? So, and I want you to be cooperative little five-year-olds in this little role play, OK? <laughs> really quickly, go. I want you to teach your five-year-old to open a door with a key, go. Five-year-olds, just stay where you are. Five-year-olds, what did your parent do that helped you to learn this skill? I know you're in the middle of this right now, but what did they do? They modeled. I want you to think about how difficult this would have been if I'd said you can't use any props, you have to put your hands behind your back, and you have to talk your child through this skill. It would have been much, much more difficult. Here's what I want you to understand as a parent. The most powerful way of teaching your children is to model. If you want them to be respectful, model it. If you want them to be hardworking, model it. If you want them to have integrity, model it. They're watching what you do every day. And sometimes what you do speaks louder than what you say. So many of you, without me telling you a thing, you, you modeled for the child how to do it, all right? So if you're trying to teach social skills, it's the same thing. You need to model it for your children, OK? What else did your parent do, five-year-olds, that helped you learn this skill? They, they explained to you in words that you could understand, so it was age appropriate. And you didn't know the difference between right and, right and left, so they said, turn it towards the window. Good job. So what else did they do? 
They gave you a chance to practice. They can't watch forever. At some point, you have to take the key and do it. Some of you did guided practice. You took your child by the hand, and you took them through the motions, and then you let them do it, OK? And I heard feedback going on. People were saying, good job. Some people said in the beginning, if you open the door, mommy will get you a cookie. <laughs> That's called bribery. Other people said, a big boy knows how to open a door with a key, OK? You know what to do. You can have a seat. You know what to do. There are, the first thing you need to do is, is motivate them, OK? The next is, you, a lot of you, I saw you do this without me telling you to do it at all. Many of you broke it down into small steps. The first thing we do, and then the next thing we do. But good skill training breaks it down into small teachable steps. The next step was, you model for them. And adults, by the way, adults spend too much time explaining, not enough time modeling. When in doubt, model, OK? And when explaining, make sure you explain in age-appropriate terms. The next thing was, you practiced. Let them practice. And you gave them feedback. It doesn't help a child to tell them. Good feedback tells them exactly what they need to change in order to be successful. It doesn't help a child when you say to them things like, you're not doing it right. You know what? They're not stupid. They figured that out. The door isn't opening. They got that figured out. Good feedback would tell them exactly what they need to change in order to be successful. This time, try turning it towards the window. Click. Good job. OK? And then they, they need to know this is a skill that is transferable. They can use it on the front door, the back door, the car door. It's a skill that they can use in, in a lot of areas of their life. And let them customize. They will say things to you like, Mom, I wouldn't do it that way. And what do you say? Show me how you would do it. How many of you have seen five-year-olds tie their shoes in some incredibly creative ways? <laughs> there is more than one way to tie your shoes. Do you know that? And it doesn't matter if they do it your way. What matters is, does the shoe stay tied? And can they repeat that process tomorrow morning? If the answer is yes to both of those, we have success. All right? Let them customize. Now, I want to take asset number 35 on your list, because here's one that I, I find kids need to know. So um, if I were teaching you right now, if I were teaching you this skill, how to say no to your friends without you losing your friends, here's, here's how I might do it um, with a group of kids. Let's say middle school kids right now. Your name is? Lisa. Lisa. Um, Lisa, give me the name of a good friend of yours, first name. Judy, if I told you Judy was a bad influence on you and you should drop her, um, would you do that if I told you to do that? No. No, why? Because I've known her a long time. Yeah, you know her, and, and I don't know all that you know about her, and she's a good person, right? right? So if you learn this skill, there's a really good chance you can keep your friends, and I want you to keep your friends, OK? Thanks. OK? Um, your name is? Rod. Rod. Rod, what's the most boring? You're a middle school kid. What's the most boring thing you can think of doing on Friday night? Staying home, watching Masterpiece Theater with your parents every Friday night for the next three months. Would that be a great time? No. <laughs> my kids, after one semester in my classroom, they said, you're against everything that's fun. Which made me rethink how I teach, because I love to have a good time. And I want you to have a good time. So if you learn this skill, not only can you keep your friend, I want you to have fun. Okay? And the last thing, I want you to stay out of trouble. I still remember in the ninth grade, my dad and I bought a trail bike together. It was a Honda 90. We had an agreement. It wasn't legal for me to drive it on the street. And I told my dad that I wouldn't do that. And I paid for half of it, and he paid for half of it. But it just so happened in the ninth grade, I fell in love for the first time. Her name, her name was Val. She lived three miles from our house. And one Saturday, my parents were gone. And I figured three miles was too far to, to walk. So I got on the trail bike, and I drove over to her house. And I stayed longer than I should have. And it started to rain, and I'm trying to hustle and get back home like it sometimes does in Seattle. And a car stops in front of me, and I can't stop in time. And I have to lay the bike over in order to avoid hitting this car. And I get scraped up, not seriously scraped up, but the bike hits the curb, and it bends up the front fork and the front wheel. I can't drive it home. I have to walk it home. I still, to this day, I still remember the feeling in the pit of my stomach when I got home and looked up the driveway to see my dad's car there. Anybody ever been there before? Yeah. See, and, and here's, here's what I want you to know. If you learn this skill, you can keep your friends, have fun, and stay out of trouble. What am I doing right now? Step one, I'm just trying to motivate you to want to learn this skill, OK? So here's, 
If, you, am I, if I'm teaching a kid a skill right now, let's do this really quickly. Is it Annette? Annette and I are, are juniors in high school. He didn't know I was going to pick on you, but no. Um, and, and, and that's my girlfriend, okay? Ooh. You're looking great, by the way. Now, so we, what do we tell our kids? It, when, when somebody says, uh, when, your kids, when you're talking to your kids about this issue, when somebody asks you to do something that's, that's trouble, what do you tell them to do? I hear a lot of parents saying things like, just say no and walk away. You ever think about what that really looks like for a kid? Here's Annette, here's my girlfriend. She says, hey, Clay, it's Friday night. A group of our friends are getting together. They've got a keg of beer. It's going to be a great party. And we tell, we tell our kids, just say no and walk away. Do you know what that looks like? It looks like this. No, Annette. <laughs> do you know any junior in high school who would do that to his girlfriend? You see, if your kids believe it's a choice of risking trouble or risking a relationship, which will they do? Yeah, they'll risk trouble before they'll risk the relationship. Don't paint it in those terms. You're going to lose if you do. By the way, saying no and walking away works really well if it's the local pervert. It does not work well if it's your girlfriend. Okay? So that one doesn't work for them. Here's another strategy. Annette says, hey, a group of our friends are getting together. They've got a keg of beer. It's going to be a great party. And I say, uh, you know, Annette, I'd really like to go, but my dog's been really sick lately. I don't know what it is. Serious dental problems of some kind. Maybe, maybe some other time. What am I doing right now? N yeah, I am. <laughs> but that's not what we tell our kids. I've heard a lot of adults say to kids, make an excuse and get out of it. What are you saying to your kids when you say make an excuse and get out of it? Lie to your friends. And if you tell kids to lie to their friends, that's inconsistent with what you've told them in any other situation. And if I lied to Annette on a regular basis, would she be my girlfriend? No. Did I have fun? No. Did I stay out of trouble? Maybe with alcohol, but I got wheels. Okay. And if I get busted, I lose my license. Look, you like to dance, I like to dance. There's an underage dance club in downtown Omaha. Dave and Cheryl, our friends, are going tonight. You want to go? Let's go? Okay, don't stand there. Let's go. <laughs> now, little round of applause. She didn't know I was going to pick on her. Okay, now, that's a skill. Can we do the next slide up here really quickly? That skill has steps. The first step, just keep it right there, is ask questions. You need to teach your kids to ask questions. Here's my friend, Eileen, who has a history of taking things from 7-Eleven without paying for them. I know you didn't want me to bring that up this evening, right? And she says, hey, Clay, right after school, let's go to 7-Eleven. What would be a good question? <laughs> you got any money would be a good question. And, and Eileen says, is it Eileen? Um, Slow Bob's work on the counter. I'll keep him busy. He likes girls. You go grab a two-pound bag of M&M's. We'll split them outside. Do I have to ask any more questions? Plainer peanut. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Still shoplifting, right? So ask questions is a first step. The next step, name the trouble. I try and teach kids the legal names of troubles, especially when they're younger, because it sounds different. If you were in a cocktail lounge at, at 2 o'clock or 1.30 in the morning and the cocktail waitress came up to you and said, last call, last call for a DUI or a DWI, are you more inclined or less inclined to have a drink? You know, it's, your name is Steve. Steve, um, we're ninth graders. Hey, let's cut out of our fourth period class because um, Ron's been giving me a bad time and you're one of the meanest dudes in ninth grade and you can help me take care of him. That's one way of asking. Here's another way. Steve, fourth hour, you want to commit truancy and assault and battery? Does that sound different? So I try and teach kids the legal names of trouble because legal, legal names imply legal consequences. But it's not always illegal stuff they're asked to do. It's kind of like, did you study for the math test? No, you never have to. You're so smart. Look, I'm just going to sit behind you today. Just kind of write your answers really big and just scoot your paper out to the right. I want to just check my answers. That's, that's cheating. Next step. So name the trouble. The next one is, is identify consequences. By the way, parents, this is why it is so important that you have these really meaningful conversations with your kids about what the consequences are. If I, because they should be able to answer the question, if I did that, my dad would, and kill me is not a, an appropriate answer. My dad wouldn't let me hang out with you anymore, and you're my best friend. I'd be grounded. You know my dad. Okay? So this is why you need to have these really important conversations about consequences with your children. All right? So identifying the consequence, if I did that, 
My dad would, but you know, or my mom would, but here's what I really want to move you to. It's a higher level of moral development to get your children to talk about inner consequences. Not that I, I can't do that because my mom will be upset or my dad will be upset. It's a higher level of more. We are in deep trouble as a society if the only reason our kids say no to things is because their mother would be upset. At some point, they need to start talking about inner trouble, which is I wouldn't feel good about doing that. Do you understand that? Because when they get to high school, even though they know you are going to be upset with that behavior, they would never say that to their friends. But they can say, I wouldn't feel good about doing that, okay? So if I said, hey, Annette, you want to go on, on a date on Friday night? Sure. <laughs> no, not, not sure. Use, use step one. This, this only works if you want to say no. It does not work if you want to say yes, okay? See, so what are we going to do? And, and what do I say? You're one of the cutest girls in the, in the junior class. I just want to get to know you a little better. No, and if she really starts asking, am I really going to tell her what I have in mind? No, but she knows what I'm, what I'm getting at, and what is she going to say at this point? My mom would be really upset with that? No, but she can say, and actually, this is the young women, when, they brought, when we brought this situation, they brought it up, and we, we were talking about how do you deal with this, the most comfortable response for them went something like this, Clay, I really like you, but I wouldn't feel good about doing that, so instead, why don't we? Okay? That's, you understand, when she says, I wouldn't feel good about that, it's not that my mom would be upset, she would be, but, but no, I wouldn't feel good about it. What am I gonna say? Oh yeah, you would. No, trust me, I wouldn't, okay? Next one. If you notice what I did, and if you forget everything I'm telling you tonight, when I suggested an alternative, what I said in this little role play we did was, look, when I talked about consequences, the coach would be upset, I'd get booted off the team, I'd lose my license. And then I said, you like to dance, I like to dance. There's an underage dance club, and if you notice what I did, I physically started to move when I suggested that alternative. If you forget everything I'm telling you tonight, please remember, teach your children to suggest an alternative and physically move, because here's Annette, she's pressuring me to go to the party. All of a sudden, I start moving and suggesting an alternative. Who has to make a decision now? Annette has to make it. You reverse peer pressure when you suggest an alternative and physically start to move, all right? And, and the last one, she might not go with me. She might say, you know, no, I want to go to the party. And so the response would, would sound like this. If you change your mind, Annette, give me a call. I'll be around till about five. And if you don't call, I'm going to go do something with the guys, but I'd rather be with you. Got to go. Boom. This is tough stuff, but you know what? It's not about teaching your, it's not about saying to your kids, just say no. You need to empower your children by teaching them how, okay? So here's what I want you to do. For time's sake, I'm, I'm not gonna have you, well, yeah, really quickly, same partner, stand up. I, I, would be, I would be delinquent if I didn't do this because I'd be doing just what I tell you not to do with your kids. Just go home and teach this to your children. No. You, you won't do it well unless you practice it. So here's what I want you to do. Tallest member in this group of two, you're the troublemaker. <laughs> Shortest member of this group of two, I want you to use the skill. And here's, here's, my first little, here's my first little suggestion. I want you to physically position yourself so you can see this screen because this is your cheat sheet. All right? So if you get lost, the steps are up here. You feel free to customize. You don't have to do it the way it is on the screen. These are just suggested steps. You may do it a little differently. But the goal is I want you to keep your friend, have fun, and I want you to stay out of trouble. Everybody got it? Now, whoever is, use, is the troublemaker in this, this role play, I want you to be vague in the beginning, which means you need to make them do step one, which is ask questions. So I might say something like, um, Meet me right after school. I want to go over to the park. What are we going to do? Great. What are we going to do? <laughs> I took some cigarettes out of my mom's purse. We're 12, and I've never smoked before. I know you've never smoked before. I thought we'd just try them. Now, if they do step one, which is ask questions, tell them what the trouble is. Don't make this 20 questions. And then, troublemakers, I want you to be quiet and let them go through the steps and the skill. There's a tendency, and this is troublesome to me, that a lot of people 
parents are really good troublemakers and not very good skill users. They're putting all kinds of pressure, like don't be a wuss, you chicken, you never do anything with us, don't do any of that. I know that may be real world for your kids. I just want you to let them go through the steps and the skill. As soon as you finish, I want you to flip-flop roles. Whoever was the skill user, I want you to, to now be the troublemaker. I just want you to both try it once. You'll, you will be better at teaching your children the skill if you've, if you've at least thought it through and practiced it just at least once. And I'd suggest practicing it more than once. But try it out really quickly. Go. Tell them how old you are in this role play, too. So you're 12 or you're 14 or you're five. Don't wait for me to say switch. As soon as you finish the role play, switch roles, and both of you try using the skill, OK? Remember to move when you suggest the alternative. That's a lot of people forget. Now, thank your partner. Have a seat. Now, where did you have problems? As you tried to use a skill, where did you have problems? <coughs> Let me tell you where your kids are going to have problems. Coming up with good alternatives. One of the things I'm going to suggest is, for those of you who have kids who are um, upper elementary, middle, or high school, you need to have a code word with your kids. That code word, at our house it was pizza growing up. So if the girls called and said, Dad, can I bring a friend over for pizza? It meant something's going on and I'm not comfortable with it. And the answer was, sure, do you need me to come get you? And I would rather pay for pizza than have to deal with some of, of what some families have had to deal with. Okay? So we had, we had a code word, all right? Um, they used it, both the girls used it one time, and we had a, an agreement also, which is if you do that, I won't ask two questions. And the questions are, what were you being asked to do and who asked? They're afraid. And I said, look, if you take care of yourself and you do what I've asked you to do, I trust you and, and, and you handle the situation the way it needs to be handled. But you, I, I do think you need to have a code with your kids so that, that, when, that they do have an alternative in some cases that are really difficult and they don't know how to get out of it, OK? Um, I also think it's, it's really hard um, for them to remember to move. And I, and I noticed many of you, as you tried to use the skill, were suggesting an alternative, but many of you were not moving when you suggested the alternative. You are much more powerful when you are, you look more convincing when you're moving rather than standing there flat-footed, all right? Um, the question was asked, what about, this is one-on-one, -on -one, but what happens when you got three kids pressuring one kid? And that's the real world. The, the strategy is divide and conquer. If there are three people pressuring me right, right here, your name is? Marilyn. 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 Marilyn and? Doug. Doug and? Judy. Judy. 
Marilyn, Doug, Judy. So if they're all pressuring me right now to go drinking before the game, okay, what what I want to do is pick the, the person that I have the best relationship in this group. Let's say it's Judy. So I say, hey, Judy, you, you take them aside. Say, hey, Judy, come here. I want to talk to you for just a second. And I take her aside one-on-one. -on -one. I can't deal with three-on-one. The, the strategy is divide and conquer. And I might say, hey, Judy, um, look, that new guy in math class is going to be at the game tonight. You know that guy you were asking about? And, and I could introduce you if you, if you want to go instead of going to drinking before the game. So if Judy says yes, then we invite Marilyn, Doug, to go with us. If that doesn't work, I don't go, Marilyn, come here for a second, I want to talk to you. <laughs> and that doesn't work, and then I say, Doug, come here. You need to take your best shot, which is the person you have the best relationship with. Try it one-on-one. -on -one. If it works, then invite the others to go along. If it doesn't, you've got to take yourself out of the situation, OK? This is tough stuff, but I really want, to under want you to understand if you want your kids to make it, they need to know how to do these things, not just tell them what to do, all right? One last strategy, and then we're going to kind of try and wrap this all together. Um, I want to take the area of positive values, because I know many of you work with your children on, on the issue of positive values. And the question is always, how do we teach positive values to kids? And if we can, the, the, a guy shows up in my office several years ago. His name is John Graham. He's a Harvard graduate and former CIA operative in Vietnam, interesting man. He said, I need your help. Most of what I've done for a living uh, is I, I've developed a lot of curriculum materials for schools. And he said, I want you to help me teach children to be courageous. And as soon as he said that, he could have set the hook and reeled me in. I thought, this is a great concept. He said, we've identified 750 people around the United States who, who we call them giraffes. And if you're interested in this, go to www.giraffe.org. They have their stories, some of their stories online. These are stories of people who stick their necks out and do courageous things in their community. They call them giraffes because they have long necks and they stick them out on a regular basis. I said, give me an example of a giraffe. He said, there's a 13-year-old boy in the Midwest who fixed up a bicycle and donated it to a group home in his neighborhood. And when he came back, his mom could tell he was upset. And she said, what's the matter? Didn't the boys like the bike? And he said, oh, mom, they like the bike. He said, but there were 18 boys in this group home and they had to stand in line to ride a bike. And his comment was, a boy shouldn't have to stand in line to ride a bike. So he committed to fix up bicycles. People b drop off broken bikes at his house. He takes parts from one, scavengers parts, and builds bikes that work. And he gives, he gives these bikes to kids who don't have bikes. And he's 13. John said, I have 749 other stories. Do you want to hear them? I could have spent the whole day with him, OK? Um, but he said, the first thing, if you want your children to be courageous, tell them stories of courageous people. If you want them to be hardworking, tell them stories of hardworking people, OK? So the first thing, it was about telling the stories. The second thing he said, help them find the stories in their own neighborhood, in their own family, and, and let them tell their story, OK? I, I was reminded of this. If, if you liked any of this this evening. Part of you liked it because I tell stories. Huh? And, and we stop telling stories way too early in children's experience. Okay? Adults like stories. I was reminded, I, um, this has been a difficult year and a half for me. I, my mom passed away in the last year and a half, and my sister passed away. And, and my mom, uh, when she was living, she lived in an assisted care facility. She had chronic lung disease, and I, I bought her one of these jazzy power chairs, you know? And, and my mom, you have to know my mom, when she had a driver's license, she wasn't a good driver, all right? <laughs> but you put a joystick in her hand, and she was really dangerous, right? And she never could quite figure this out. And she would go down the hallway, scraping the paint off the wall all the way down the hallway. And she'd get in the elevator, and people would get out of the elevator, right? And, and so I, when she passed away, I saved this chair because my sister, who died this last year of ovarian cancer, was very sick. And I thought, Nora may need this, so I kept the chair. And, and she passed away, didn't need the chair. And so it's been sitting in my basement. And I, not too long ago, I decided, well, I, I'm just going to clean it up, put it on Craigslist, sell it cheap, and someone will get to use it, and it'll do somebody some good. So I, I was cleaning it up, and I started laughing because it had all this paint on the side of it, and I'm cleaning it off. And I'm thinking about my mom. 
And, and then it occurred to me, when we talk about being courageous, so she's, she's 84 years old, she lives in an assisted care facility, and, and she had meals every day with, with two other women, both who had power chairs, I called them the three musketeers. Mentally they were really sharp, physically they were wrecks, okay? And, and they would have lunch and dinner and, and breakfast together every day. And I came to take my mom to lunch one day and, and they, were, they were all chattering and they were laughing and they said, you should have seen your mom last week. So they're telling me this story and there's, there's this, uh, the facility she lives in, most of the women who, and it's mostly women who care for uh, the residents, um, are paid minimum wage. They did a wonderful job, a lot of them women of color. And one day, there's an old gnarly and surly guy who comes down to, to lunch and dinner every day and makes these comments. And one day, he made a racist comment about one of the women who work there. And my mom, told, my mom overheard the comment, and she told him to shut up. And, and he's in a wheelchair as well, but he doesn't have a power chair. And so he's walking in his wheelchair and shuffling by, and he flips her off and, and walks down the hallway. And the, the women who are sitting at the table with her said, you should have seen your mom. She grabs the water pitcher off the table, and she's got this joystick, so she does about a 360, spills half of the pitcher on the floor, but then puts it in overdrive, hyperdrive, and she's chasing him down, and he's shuffling, and she's powering, right? She gets to him, and she dumps water over this guy to the cheers of residents and staff. And, and um, so they're telling me this story, and so I'm taking my mom out to lunch that day, and as we walk by the front desk, the woman at the front desk says, Mrs. Roberts, remember when you come back, you have to sign our new code of conduct policy. <laughs> and I said, Mom, do you think this has anything to do with what you did last week? And we were both laughing. She said, I don't care, he deserved it. It was her little act of courage, you know, even with a body that had deserted her, she, she just said, I couldn't stand there and listen to this guy anymore. I was just sick of it, you know? Um, so we need to tell our children those stories. Find the stories, tell the stories, then help them become the story, all right? How do you do that? Really quickly, next slide if we could do this. Um, here's what they know about the giraffes. The first thing I can tell you is giraffes find their spark and their passion. I think your job is to help your children find their spark and passion, okay? Because when they find their passion, when they find their spark, do you know what I'm talking about when I say spark? It's what, lit, what lights them up, what turns them on, what keeps them focused, okay? Let me just give you, I, I have a couple sparks. One of them happens to be basketball, and the University of Washington right now is playing in the Maui Classic against uh, Kentucky tonight, and I'm here, and, I, and I'm dying no, to want to know what the score is, you know? So one of them is basketball. Um, <laughs> several years ago, 20 years, 20 plus years ago, Three of my buddies, were, we were playing in a three-on-three -three tournament in Seattle, and the computer burped and put us in with guys who were six inches taller, ten years younger, all with college playing experience. They killed us. Three games were out. Now we're whining on a street corner in downtown Seattle about having to play against, against the big boys. And my, my best friend, Freddie Jackson, says, you know, we ought to have a camp for guys over 35 who can't give up the game. I said, yeah, we could call it the Hoopaholics Treatment Center. We got going on this concept. We got a former NBA player, Steve Hawes, to be the camp pro. We got, we got uh, 10 high school coaches to coach the team. And we get guys to pay a lot of money to come and to camp once a year to play with other old guys. And our other passion happens to be children, so we made this a fundraiser for Child Haven, which is a treatment center for abused kids. Um, we've raised over a half a million dollars. We have t-shirts and shorts and hats that are sold around the country called it, we call it Hoopaholics gear. My favorite is one of the t-shirts from camp a few years ago that has a tombstone with a rim mounted on it. And the caption reads, above the ground but below the rim, which is kind of where we've been playing a long time. So, and the, and the giraffes in this story are my friend Freddie and, and Steve Hawes. So here's what I can tell you. If you want your children to be, someone said, how do you, how do you help your kids find their passion or their spark? My, my suggestion is find yours. If, if, if no one is modeling for them what it means to be passionate about something, how are they supposed to get it, okay? So the first thing is giraffes find their spark and passion. The second thing, giraffes are visionary. They don't see things the way they are. They see things the way they could be, okay? 
And the third thing I can tell you about giraffes is they look at obstacles and resources, but they focus more on the resources than they do the obstacle. If, if somebody says, you know, we couldn't do that here in La Vista, it wouldn't work, don't listen to them. They are not the giraffes. You know what the giraffes say? We could do it, and here's how. They, they're looking for ways of making it happen, not reasons why it can't happen, okay? Giraffes are committed and sometimes they need to be committed, if you know what I mean. They are not easily dissuaded. You need to get out of their way if you don't like their idea. And the next thing I teach kids is giraffes have a plan. And sometimes that plan is incredibly creative. I met a group of physicians in Australia. They call their group bugger up. I won't give you the literal translation. These are pulmonary doctors who go around in broad daylight defacing tobacco billboards. They say, we're no longer going to bury our patients without a fight. We're going to fight the tobacco industry. <laughs> and so here was their plan. 36 physicians went to jail in one year for defacing tobacco billboards in Australia. They would go, they'd go up on, on a billboard in the middle of the afternoon, downtown Sydney, cell phone in hand, and they call the local TV station and say, you might want to get a camera crew out here. We have a physician defacing the camel billboard at Third and Broad. The camera crew shows up, captures this physician defacing the billboard. She gets down. She is arrested. She pays a $500 fine and spends one day in jail. And she's on the news. 36 times they got primetime news coverage for $500 a spot. They thought that was a bargain price, okay? They have a plan, okay? The next thing I can tell you, giraffes don't ask for permission, they ask for forgiveness. You, you need to do what's right and ask for forgiveness, okay? And the last thing is, giraffes don't rest on their laurels, they reflect and celebrate their successes, and then they, they keep moving, okay? The Giraffe Project right now is looking for a fast food restaurant that would have trading cards of young people who stick their necks out in a community and make a difference in their community. Wouldn't it be interesting to go to Sonic or someplace and, and have kids pick up trading cards of other kids in this community who did courageous things? Now, the reason I told you this in the end, you know why I told you this. I, I really think it's important to teach our kids positive values. And I think, again, it starts with us modeling it. And I think we can do it through stories and examples. Last, so let me give your assignments, and, and then I'll open it if we got any questions here at the end. Here's some assignments I'd like you to do as a result of coming here this evening. The first is, I want you to engage in random acts of asset building with, with your kids and with neighbors and friends and family members, all right? The second is, I want you to share your post-it note that you wrote with your child or for your child sometime in the next week. The third is, I want you to share this material, and I think we have some extras on the table outside, with somebody who is not in this room tonight. I know this is a bad time of the year to do this, but here's what I know. If you're really trying to start a movement, the movement begins with you. And I want you to share this information with two or three people who are not in the room tonight, so that we begin to get a picture about what we all need to be about if, if we really want our kids to grow up healthy, successful, contributing members to our community, okay? So you need to pay it forward. You need to share it with some people who are not in this room, okay? Um, the, the last thing uh, I would ask you to do is just to think about what are you personally going to do just a little different, a little better than you've been doing. Um, let me give you a quick example. My friends don't get this. Um, I'm, I'm of retirement age, and I have a group of buddies who still play basketball and I ride bikes with when I'm home. And they, they're saying, you're going where? The day before Thanksgiving? Do you know that's the worst travel day of the year? And they didn't get it. And, and I'm a lucky guy to get to do what I do because I, I love this model because I think the model changed me. I think I was a pretty good guy before I saw this model. I think I'm a better guy having seen the model, and I don't think I'm where I want to be at this point yet. But let me give you the quick example. I'm, I'm a volunteer in my own community. A few years ago, I was doing a presentation like this to a group of parents. I asked them that evening, do you know every kid in your neighborhood? Do you know them by name? Do you stop and talk with them when you see them on the street? Do you know what they're good at? Do you call them when they're doing, on things when they're doing things that are inappropriate? I asked 
parents in my community that evening those questions. And I drove home feeling pretty good. And I drove in my driveway and my headlights scan across the house next door. That was the moment of truth for me. Because I'd ask them all, do you know every kid in your neighborhood? And you know what the answer for me was? We had a new family that moved in that year. I'd met the older boy, I hadn't met the younger boy, and I'm thinking to myself, what a hypocrite. You just spent the evening asking everybody and telling them they should know every kid in their neighborhood, and you don't know every kid in your neighborhood. So I made a mental note of that. That weekend, I'm out in the yard, working in my yard. We have a dog, they have a dog, they've just moved in, our dogs are getting to know each other through the fence. I won't give you all the details. <laughs> but one of the things they were doing is they're running up and down this fence line because they can see each other. And they're chasing each other, and they're having the best time. And I'm laughing at my dog, and I look over, and here's Brian, who's 14, who is my neighbor, who I haven't met. And I thought, perfect timing. I walked over, I introduced myself. We began talking over the fence. He said, I got to go, because I got to mow the lawn. They've just moved in. Their lawn is really heavy and thick. It's all wet. He's got a new power mower. It's a push mower. And so he, he cranks it up, and it goes about 10 feet, and it dies. It gets all clogged up with grass. And so he, clean, he turns it over, cleans it out, cranks it up again, another 10 feet, it dies. He's going to be at this all afternoon. And then I realized I could help him out because we have a riding lawnmower. So I said, hey, Brian, if you help me get the grass catcher off this, we could get it in your backyard. We could knock this down really quickly. So he's helping me. And then I realized he's 14. What would he love to do? Drive this thing. So now I'm teaching a 14-year-old to drive with a clutch for the first time using my lawnmower. It was painful. <laughs> The first thing I learned that afternoon is that a John Deere can do a wheel stand. Do you know that? <laughs> if you crank the throttle up high enough and you pop the clutch quickly enough, you can get the front wheels off the ground, which he did several times. And I don't think I saved him any time because it took him about a half hour to mow the lawn. An hour later, he's still over there doing figure eights and all this stuff. And I, uh, he finally brings my lawnmower back. He said, I want to pay you back. And I said, what did you have in mind? He said. I'll mow your yard. <laughs> I mean, he just wanted to drive. And so I, I'm, I'm laughing, and I said, well, Brian, I just finished mowing my lawn. You don't need to do that. And he said, well, what do you do for a living? So we're talking. He said, well, do you have a website? I said, no. He said, how come? I said, well, because I'm technologically challenged. He said, I could build you one. We got to talk, and he said, let me see your computer set up. My office is in my home. So I take him in my office. He starts looking around. He said, man, this stuff's really old. You need new equipment. I said, well, what would you suggest? He said, well, tell me how you use your computer. I'm talking with a 14-year-old about how I use my computer. He doesn't say much. He just listens. He goes home. He comes back two days later. He's gone online and custom designed both a laptop and a desktop system for me. He's printed it out in hard copy. And he gives me this. He said, this is what you need to buy. Now, my laptop's up here, but you've got to see it. It's smaller. It's, it's um, you know, and, and here's how much thought a 14-year-old put into this. He said, you travel a lot. It needs to be light. It weighs about four pounds. He said, most laptops have a bigger screen. But because you travel on airplanes, when people lean their seat back on a plane, it's really hard to use a big screen. You want a smaller screen. He said, you got big hands. You need a full-size keyboard. It's almost full size. I mean, this is how much thought a 14-year-old put into this for me. He said, so we get done with all this. And I thought, you know what? I was going to upgrade anyway. Why not now? So I call the computer store. I have Brian standing in my office. I have Julie from the computer store on speakerphone. And I'm asking questions like, what's your return policy? This is my level of sophistication. <laughs> Brian, on the other hand, is asking questions like, what's the bus on this computer? And she said, can I put you on hold? She didn't know what he was asking either. I said, Brian, what is a bus? He said, I got you this really fast processor. It has to go through a highway to get up to your screen. That's the bus. He said, if you've got a narrow highway and a fast processor, you're paying for speed, you're not getting it all. You need a wide highway with, with a fast processor, a wide bus. She came back on with numbers that meant absolutely nothing to me. And he goes, this is really good. He coached me through the whole process. We got done. I said, hey, Julie, how old do you think my computer consultant is? She said, he's a 20-something techie from Microsoft, I can tell. And I've got this 14-year-old just beaming in the corner of my office. I said, no, he's 14. He's my neighbor. But he is my consultant, OK? And if you could have seen this young man when I first met him, he was this overweight kid who spent most of his time in front of a computer, OK? I'm a cyclist. Uh, that, that year, I bought a new bike, and I had my old bike in the garage. And Brian went on an outward bound experience. He came back. He'd lost a little weight. He was feeling good about himself. I said, hey, Brian, if you want to ride together, we could ride together. 
So we began riding together. Today Brian has his own road bike. It's nicer than my road bike. He bought it with his computer consulting money. Yeah, I'm paying him. But here's what I want to, I just want to remind you, none of this would have happened had I not taken five minutes over the back fence to find out what an incredible young man I have living next door. If you think tonight's about somebody else, I just want to remind you, if it's really a movement, the movement begins with you. And it's just about doing this a little more deliberately, a little more intentionally with our own children and with children in our neighborhoods and the kids that our kids hang out with that will make this, wouldn't it be nice for La Vista to be known as the best place in Nebraska for kids to grow up and for families to live? Wouldn't that be a nice thing to be known for? Obviously, many of you believe it's a really good place. That's why you choose to live here. But again, I think good can be the enemy of great. So what can you do to step this up and make it just a little better, okay? Um, I'm going to stop here because we said, I think we said two hours, and we're at two hours. Um, questions about the research about anything that we've said tonight or haven't said? I know this is the point where everybody's going, don't ask any questions. We need to go. <laughs> well, here's... Yes. It's not a question. I just uh, an observation is a lot of these things are uh, parallel to selling. Parallel to? Selling. Yeah. Selling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there's, in fact, I, I did a presentation in Ripon, California not too long ago, and a guy comes up to me at break and he said, people pay you to do this? He said, what are you, the CEO of Common Sense? And we both started laughing, and my comment was, common sense, just not common practice. A lot of this we've known and we've learned in a lot of different areas of our life, okay? But, but what I want us to understand is there's a huge knowing-doing gap in America. People know what to do. Our research says that 40% of adults who know what to do don't do it on a regular basis with kids. It's not a matter of knowing. It's a matter of doing. In fact, a young man a few years ago when I uh, was at a national conference, 17-year-old young man was the keynote speaker, and he said to the audience, he quoted Stokely Carmichael, he said, don't tell me what you believe. Tell me what you do, and I'll tell you what you believe. It's not what we know, and we've learned this in a variety of areas of our life. It's what we do that makes a difference. So as much as it's great that you came here tonight, unless you do something differently with it, we wasted everybody's time, okay? Any others? Last thing then, um, I want you to go to uh, Search's website when you have a moment. There's wonderful resources for parents if you want to go deeper with this. Um, I, want you, I want to thank the district staff, um, again, Ron in particular, where's Ron, you're up here in this corner, for uh, making all this happen. And I know it wasn't easy to pull off at this time of the year. And I want to thank you all for being here this evening. I know you could have been someplace else, but I think it speaks uh, it speaks well of this community to have this kind of a turnout on the night before we're getting everything ready for Thanksgiving. So have a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'll stick around if there are any questions, but go do. And uh, we're going to try and reinforce this with staff tomorrow, okay? I'll stick around if there are questions, but go.